Okay, good afternoon, um, everybody, and thank you all for coming to the first um, keynote lecture of Linked Pasts 6. Um, we're absolutely delighted um, to uh, have invited for our first keynote uh, Professor Constance Crompton, who is a Professor of Communication and the Canada Research Chair in Digital Humanities at the University of Ottawa. Um, and she is going to speak to us on um, linked data across time and space, the challenge of modelling temporal identities and places. Over to you, Connie. Hi, uh, good morning and good evening, uh, everybody. It's, um, I'm delighted to be here and I, I do wish we could all be here in person, but um, it's been great to even just to see like the Twitter buzz for the conference um, online to know that like lots of people are here, even if we aren't um, all physically here uh, together. Wait, well, I'll start, I guess, with uh, a quick screen share. Uh, so today there are a few things I'd like to talk about. Um, both sort of some like methodological concerns that come from archival research and that have shaped some of the thinking of the, the Lesbian and Gay Liberation in Canada project that I'll be using as my case study today. Um, and then to, to talk through our attempts to sort of move what we know about our historical subjects into sort of linked data form and how best uh, working with collaborators, we've been trying to sort of think through uh, questions of um, of how to do justice to those data sources, um, but also to like aim for, and their specificity, and also uh, aim for like maximum um, interoperability. Uh, so that's what I guess I will be sort of talking through for the, the next uh, 30 to 40 minutes, and then happily we have time for, um, for questions and discussion, which is sort of the best part um, of being able um, to be here all together. Um, so the project that uh, is the sort of case study at the, the heart of this talk is the Lesbian and Gay Liberation in Canada project, which I co-direct with my research partner, uh, Michelle Schwartz from Ryerson University uh, in Toronto, here in Canada. Uh, and that one of the things that we're quite interested in the project is sort of the history of, um, uh, of what it is that, that uh, lesbians were doing in the 20th century in their attempts to structure data, uh, connect data together for ease of um, dissemination. What does it mean to be sort of part of a minority group within a minority group um, trying to share information with one another? And then we, we're sort of thinking through to what's the best way to use linked data to share historical information um, and what can we learn from the, the practices of these women um, who we are studying. Uh, the uh, the, pro the digital project itself, which we'll look at in a moment, uh, spans 1964 to 1981 in Canada, from sort of the start of the first homophile association in Canada um, up to the start of the AIDS crisis, and uh, that we have uh, 34,000 uh, entities, events, um, uh, protests, uh, legislative change, people, places, organizations, uh, uh, periodicals, um, all connected together. Uh, and in trying to sort of theorize what it is that, um, that we need to do in order to do sort of justice to our, um, to our sources, we've turned to a sort of in-depth study of uh, lesbian DIY self-publishing and, um, uh, and research as part of radical liberation um, in the 1970s. Um, in amassing uh, data um, that, that has been sort of you know, compiled over time, there really was this drive in the middle 20th century um, in North America for women to uncover these like otherwise hidden lesbian histories and to track down sort of clues, uh, you know, textual evidence that sort of um, suggested and, and, um, and hinted at in order to help women imagine a way of living that has like otherwise been uh, suppressed. Um, and, and so here we have you know, Lillian Faderman, who's a major sort of scholar um, in the field, kind of summing it up, um, that, that we really have to make it possible, in order for people to have a, a lesbian life and for a lesbian life to be possible, we have to show that it has been possible before. And so I mean, the, the history project is engaged in continuing this sort of work, but building on the, the historiographical work that, that women did um, before them. Uh, 
certainly we get, you know, scholars like um, Adrian Rich, you know, who, uh, who quotes Dickinson and looks to Dickinson as a sort of lesbian forebear um, uh, and saying, you know, my classics veiled their faces. The things that would have represented me are hidden, are missing. Um, uh, as, uh, as Rich says, in most literature courses, most libraries, syllabi curricula, young women are handed classics that veil not only what might be possible, but what might have been going on all along. Um, and that there were a number of, of, um, of early scholars who were, uh, who were working on uncovering and sharing uh, this work. Uh, the, the first who was sort of a, a major sort of mover in this, uh, in this work was uh, Jeanette Howard Foster, who was a member of the, um, in, her, in her youth, a member of the student council at Rockford uh, University in Illinois. Um, and she was called upon in this role to discipline two other female students in a morals case, which was like very sort of veiled. She wasn't even really sure what a morals case was um, referring to, it was sort of buried under what Rich later called sort of this inadequate or, um, or lying language. But the Jeanette Howard Foster said like in being called in to be the disciplinary force in this like morals case, she also realized that there were um, sort of other ways of living. And uh, she started um, the process then of researching same-sex attraction among women, um, which uh, she published as um, uh, a bibliography of references to romantic relationships between women in literature and poetry, uh, and that uh, a project that her partner, Hazel Tolliver, um, uh, continued to take up. And the two of them became sort of prime movers at um, the, uh, the Kinsey uh, Institute and, and worked on his uh, study of the sexual behavior of the human um, female at the University of uh, Kansas. So the work that she dedicated her life to is called uh, Sex Variant Women in Literature, uh, subtitled A Historical and Quantitative Survey. It kind of begins with Sappho in the 6th century um, and ends uh, 400 and 2,600 years later um, with uh, Patricia Highsmith's novel, The Price of Salt. Uh, and that, that this is all sort of self-published in 1954 and becomes like the sort of go-to work of like proof that lesbians must have existed in history. Look, here's 2,600 years of, um, you know, literary, uh, literary evidence. Uh, that uh, she self-publishes it. She sends a copy to the latter, which is the print or, uh, arm of the lesbian organization, the uh, Daughters of Bolitis in 1957. Uh, and there, Marion Zimmer Bradley uh, reviews it um, uh, favorably in the magazine, uh, and that that uh, Zimmer Bradley and another um, a woman working on the magazine, um, Barbara Greer, uh, decide to take up uh, take up Foster's work and say, okay, well, we're not just going to like let this sort of end at 1954. Um, let's continue on. So they began the work of what they called the checklist, which was a hand typed, mimeographed bibliography of lesbian content. Um, in literature. And it was first published in 1960 um, and then revised and supplemented sort of many times um, before being published in sort of more not mimeographed book form as uh, The Lesbian in Literature in 1964. Uh, in the introduction to the checklist, Bradley and Greer urged their readers to invest in Foster's book because it is the major definitive work um, on the subject. But um, they say, you know, since Foster's book was published, there are many new novels of lesbianism that have come out. Uh, and I'm quoting here, the diligent search of many collectors has brought new, old, many old ones now to light. Uh, they promise that their uh, list will, and quote again, uh, review in some detail the novels which were admitted from Dr. Foster's work and will list, uh, will strive for completeness. But their work includes many of those uh, whose lesbian content was too slight too subtle or too trashy uh, to come within the scope of the scholarly studies of Dr. Foster. Um, and so you can sort of see here what the entries look like in the lesbian in literature. So this is this, this is sort of like original mimeographed version um, uh, on the left, you know, with the, 
uh, with some of those lovely hand annotations on the side. And then the entries themselves um, uh, had uh, little synopses, the name of the author, the name of the book, um, and then uh, a coded entry. Um, in their work, A or B is for major or minor lesbian character action. C is for, quoting, uh, latent repressed lesbianism or characters who can be so interpreted, you know, sort of these uh, hints. Uh, and T indicated, I'm quoting again, uh, that regardless of the quality of lesbian action or character involved in this book, the quality of the book itself is essentially poor. Uh, so T here is for trash. Uh, but they want it to be sort of complete, so they included um, a good number of trashy novels there. Um, and so this was part of the process of like authentication uh, by accumulation, sort of a self-naming process, this grassroots uh, creation of collective meaning and identity through lists. And this like a strategy um, continued in lesbian circles through the 20th century. Uh, in 1967, the brand new Lesbian Her Stories archives in Brooklyn, New York, set out the second issue of their newsletter, uh, and it had in it the bibliography of bibliographies, which was listing titles being by lesbians and about lesbians. So we're going sort of beyond creating these, these bibliographies to having uh, bibliographies um, of bibliographies. Uh, the newsletter implores readers uh, that it is uh, clear and careful searching that is still required to find uh, lesbians in all works, including those published by feminisms, feminists, rather. Uh, bibliographies on just lesbian culture um, certainly need still to be done. Uh, that one of the major works in the field came out of this time period as well. Uh, 1967 was also the year that Lillian Faderman began her groundbreaking work on lesbian history, Surpassing the Love of Men, which would eventually be published in 1981. Faderman had discovered Foster's book in 1962 while she was still a closeted grad student at UCLA. Uh, having wandered into the stacks of the English reading room looking for books on E.M. Forrester, she found sex variant women in literature. Uh, she said she returned to the reading room again and again, reading the book while hiding it in the pages um, of another book uh, until she had read the whole thing. Um, in the introduction that she wrote for a biography of Foster, she described Foster as her new model of, and again, I'm quoting, how one could do serious scholarship about lesbian subject matter, um, and that, that Foster's work really was the inspiration for surpassing the love of men. So this like desire to list and to keep listing to kind of try to structure uh, literary and archival evidence of lesbian lives um, has continued on um, whether lesbianism is just minor or interpreted uh, and there are these drives for it to be sort of like inclusive and to include um, trash. Uh, this includes things sort of with, um, more recently uh, like um, Autostraddle, which is a website for lesbian, bisexual, queer, uh, women, cis, and trans, uh, which is, has done some of this historiographical, like pop culture um, work uh, with their top 10 lists, like uh, their top 10 most sexually prolific lesbians and bisexuals of old Hollywood. Um, uh, and some of their stuff is sort of modeled on the chart, which is famously from Showtime's um, the, the L Word, uh, in which the author uh, collates a series of historical facts and rumors and innuendo in order to map the same-sex relationships of famous female entertainers, uh, some of them like Marlene Dietrich, who lived sort of openly gay and bisexual lives, and others like Barbara Sin Stanwyck or Katharine Hepburn, um, who were potentially, I'm quoting here, uh, deeply closeted. Uh, the author uh, of uh, the Autostraddle list gleefully admits that a lot of information could be false, but it could also possibly be true, uh, <laughs> like with exclamation marks. Um, uh, which we think really embodies this lesbian historiographical uh, belief in the importance of inclusion above all else, uh, working with what, as uh, Joan Nessel, who was one of the founders of the Lesbian Her Story Archives, has said, is this drive to change deprivation uh, and silence, really, into cultural plentitude. Of course, what does this mean to sort of say, there's a long history of, even sort of without computation, um, uh, people interested in lesbian history, trying to unearth fragments to do kind of prosopographical work and to structure the, uh, the, the data that they have 
um, in some way. Also, what stories are we telling? These are all sort of like largely um, American examples. Uh, what does that mean for those of us who are trying to do research about people and placeness um, in a Canadian context? Certainly in the Lesbian and Gay Liberation in Canada project, we have um, come up against this um, challenge. This is a, a question that was asked of a research assistant of mine in an interview um, with our national French language uh, radio um, broadcaster, uh, Radio Canada. Uh, and the question here is, yeah, is there a Canadian version of Stonewall? Is there like a Canadian version of the Stonewall riots? And certainly like popular histories of gay liberation in Canada do focus on the activism of gay, white, urban, Anglophone men. And there is like a standard answer to this question that yes, the 1981 bathhouse raids in which um, police officers in uh, Toronto raided six bathhouses and uh, threatened to publish the names of the men found there in, um, in newspapers uh, led to a year of protests and, um, uh, and followed by court cases and major legislative change. But sort of like the Stonewall riots, this kind of flattens that history and sort of says, oh yes, yes, uh, you know, gay liberation uh, really is a, an urban phenomena that, um, that address the needs of, um, of uh, gay uh, white men. And of course, we know from doing this historical work that there's more uh, going on there. And I'd like to sort of like do a little bit of a gear change here um, and turn to the Lesbian and Gay Liberation in Canada project itself and sort of talk about like where our data comes from, how our sort of like DIY history is, um, is manifested and where our moves from, from trying to structure textual data has led us into, um, uh, into the world of linked data. Uh, so the LGLC project is born out of uh, two select, select chronologies uh, published by our colleague uh, Donald McLeod. Uh, and he's the acquisitions editor, or, uh, sorry, the acquisitions, the head of acquisitions at the University of Toronto Libraries. Um, and the Lesbian and Gay Liberation in Canada uh, volumes were actually really a side project of his. He's a, a longtime volunteer at what is now called the Archives with a Q. It was formerly the uh, Canadian Lesbian and Gay Archives in Toronto. Um, and that separate from his day job, uh, he volunteers there quite actively and, and is a sort of active researcher. And that he had noticed in the 1990s that researchers were coming in who didn't even really have like a handle on the gay liberation activism of only sort of 20 years before. Um, in Canada. And this motivated him to start another one of these um, uh, bibliographic projects, um, one that, that lists the events of the gay liberation movement in Canada, um, but that also offers um, the sources for them. So that, that Lesbian and Gay Liberation in Canada and Lesbian and Gay Liberation in Canada too, um, both really serve as guides not only to what happened, but to how we know what happened. Uh, what, are those, what are those sort of sources there? You can see a page here from that. Uh, people who have ever been to a conference with me before will have seen you know, this. I'm, I'm a bit, I think I said this before, like, um, uh, like uh, you know, the rhyme of the ancient mariner, like I have a, an albatross around my neck and I'm going around to all the like, party guests and like grabbing them by the lapels and saying like, do you know how wonderful this is? Like, ah. that. Um, but Don's book, uh, you know, sort of each page has a, um, uh, uh, sorry, each, each, page, each page lists events. Each event starts with a date, a place, uh, a brief prose description of what happened, and then his sources. So like already it's sort of rather structured as data goes for somebody who's not really interested in doing particularly digital work. Uh, John compiled these by going to not only the archives, but also with the Q, um, but also the British Columbian, the British Columbia Gay and Lesbian Archives, the Canadian Women's Movement Archives, which is the University of Ottawa, 
where I am, uh, the Glen Bow Museum Archives, the Toronto Reference Library, Toronto Robarts Library, and Libraries in Canada Beyond, with a box of index cards. And as he would read through um, queer periodicals, would note that like, ah, there was a bar opening, uh, you know, in this place in Winnipeg at the time and take notes. And then he typed the whole thing up. Um, Michelle and I were both volunteers at the archives when we met uh, Don, and we knew about the chronologies and, and really just from asking, like, you, you know, could, could we work with these? They, they're self-published. And so he had retained the rights to them. And he said, well, you know, they're available on the U of T, um, T space or D space uh, repository as PDFs. Like what more sort of digital would you want? Um, and we said, oh, like, it's just like asking to be sort of, um, uh, structured at least in database form, um, because it'd be so interesting to be able to sort of query and work out like what's happening uh, in these um, uh, in these events. Um, and Don said, "Well, I, sp I suppose if I don't have to do anything digital, then have at her." Uh, this was very much like the making of the project um, for us. So um, we uh, started. I don't know. At the beginning, it was like Shell and I and one uh, Oxygen XML license between the two of us and Dropbox account. Uh, we have since uh, been lucky enough to have um, funding from the uh, Canadian Social Science and Humanities Council. Uh, that means we've now had 17 research assistants on the project and it's let us really like grow uh, much more quickly than we would have uh, just on our own. Although this is one of those forever digital humanities projects. You know, there's somewhere like, we need to be sensible and you know, do something that has a, you know, two year window and then it's done. Uh, Michelle and I will be doing this until we are very old ladies. So <laughs> this is one of those uh, forever kind of projects. Um, and so we took um, Don's books. Uh, they have uh, 3,100 events in them. Um, at the time, Don himself said he didn't really even know like how many people were in there um, or even actually how many events um, he had. We've encoded the events in uh, TI, XML, uh, marking out people, places, uh, organizations, periodicals, um, as well as uh, as sources, uh, and um, uh, and that that let us do some analysis on the text to sort of work out, uh, for example, like who are the people who are the textual sources for the events, but which are really like become like as news reporters, like the people who are the witnesses to these events for us living in the now future. Um, and, and one of the things that was a big question for me was like, who are the people who are both in the events and are reporting on them? Those people who have that double role as our uh, witnesses to history. Uh, it's also let us do things like resolve um, pseudonyms for people who you know, later sort of said, actually that was me writing that all along. Uh, we have lots of people who have like multiple names over the course of their life or drag names, that kind of thing. And, and certainly the encoding let us resolve those things too. Um, and then we've contributed a lot of ancillary research. So it's like 3,100 events. Uh, we in the project now have 34,000 entities because we've created records for the people and the places and the um, uh, legislation you know, mentioned in, in the events and that kind of thing. So we've kind of grown that out from there. So we continue to do archival research uh, in order to augment these events. We've actually also recently decided to expand the dates. Uh, originally, this work all ran from 1964 to 1981. That doesn't really capture women's experience as well as we would like. Uh, those really are dates that uh, affect, or that are in response to men's experience. Uh, there are some major sort of cases in Canada that have to do with um, lesbian child custody that, that happened in 1984, so we're expanding out that way. And in terms of capturing trans, um, uh, trans history, uh, heading back to 1960 lets us do that too. So we're starting to um, expand uh, our work that way. So we've encoded in TEI and they're like, well, we'd like to create a public history forward facing web app, lglc.ca is where that is now. Uh, let's, it, it was 1994, graph databases were new and hot. Uh, so like, ha, that's what, that's the, the format we'll use. Uh, also Canadian funding agencies like it if you're doing a cutting edge thing rather than a state and safe thing. There's a lot to be said for SQL because it's not going anywhere. So actually stability for the win is my like secret feeling. But anyway, we um, uh, uh, um, wrote some scripts to convert um, the uh, 
the TEI XML into um, uh, Cypher, the, the language for our graph database, uh, kind of under the hood, and that that underpins um, our web app now, which lets people now, rather than just reading Don's book from start to finish, let's kind of aggregate and uh, trace individual people through time, uh, look at the history of a particular place for the Canadians who are here. So like, go look up your small town. I think one of the things that has been like such a joy coming out of this research is that uh, gay liberation happened everywhere. It's not just bathhouse raids in Toronto. No. Um, uh, and, and so this has been a you know, great pleasure from having this public facing, um, public facing website that uh, that we hope helps people see that, that gay liberation really did kind of happen everywhere and that lives out Don's dream of, of making it um, clear to people that, uh, that, that this is a, a time period that matters and that it, it too um, sort of won't be forgotten as we move forward in time. So we were really sort of inspired by these women who were doing this DIY gathering and by Don who was engaged in DIY publishing um, and sort of rolled up our sleeves um, to to create this now with this team of uh, 17 uh, excellent students. Uh, and it, doing this work, I was sort of we're always moved in the TI XML realm um, and had worked on, I'd worked on projects before where there was like this sort of sentiment that like, oh, do you know what would be great? That the linked data would be like nice to have, do you know, like if this project like has any money left over and time at the end, uh, we will like look into creating some linked data um, out of our TEI um, material so that we can you know, keep our, our materials you know, better connected to other projects that are working on um, similar subjects. And of course, like no project has like time or money left over um, at the end. So Michelle and I sort of thinking through like what are the best like next steps for our project? We sort of, we saw through two things uh, on the technical side the move into linked data, but also working with collaborators on creating tools that will make the conversion of data from these like beautifully curated um, TEI data sets into linked data, um, as well as in our case, um, expanding the content of um, the LGLC data set uh, to sort of live up to its name a little bit more. It's the you know, lesbian and gay liberation in Canada, but Francophone activism and women's activism uh, is actually underrepresented in our in our project um, so far. Um, on the one hand, because uh, uh, Don was using largely sort of anglophone sources, uh, I'm now at a bilingual university. Uh, we have the phones that are available to us now um, are certainly um, available in French and English, and and we have you know the archives here de Quebec and and uh, resources in Manitoba as well in French. So we're we're starting to do um, some excellent research there. Uh, I almost have to do like a shout out to Pascal Danglois, who's a, a researcher on uh, the project who has a real intellectual leadership kind of here. Uh, we've also had the challenge of uncovering women's activism, uh, which was a function of the, the archival sources we were, the, the way we're structured is yeah, a function of the archival sources we were use, we've been using, which is to say, there's a lot of like a men's, um, uh, men's work that, uh, that is easily archivable in things like uh, magazines and flyers and circulars uh, and that there are lots of women who are involved in Canadian uh, organizing that weren't producing things like that that became easily archivable. There was a big movement in Canada um, in particularly in British Columbia uh, where you get a lot of lesbian separatists, women who say like mm, if the culture really cared about women it'd be better than this. We're not actually going to try to ameliorate the situation. We're out. We're like off to live in communes in the Kootenays you know, maybe there'll be the odd like circular produced for um, uh, for a uh, like consciousness raising potluck, you know, but it's not like the run of a urban magazine that is sort of easily um, archival. We had a wonderful research assistant, Nadine Boulay, who went to interview women who are still living on the land in this way to help us develop um, events that kind of cover those things off. Uh, we've also been working on um, creating uh, linked data out of our prosopography, our record of um, of people uh, with MJ Suhan as a librarian at the university at um, the Ryerson University uh, Library. Uh, he's actually working on creating um, easy to use uh, uh, WordPress plugins for um, 
uh, for scholars who aren't necessarily going to learn like sort of the technical side um, of linked data, but to create linked data out of their um, existing kind of spreadsheet. So he's very much in that like getting people's DIY stuff into sort of linked um, format. Uh, most exciting for us though um, has been the work of the uh, Links project. This is the Linked Infrastructure for Networked Cultural Scholarship, which is directed by Susan Brown at the University of Guelph. And uh, that I'm a team lead for the University of Ottawa on this project, which is which has the goal of bringing together um, plain text as well as structured data set text data sets from the library world, um, but as as well from the um, humanities and digital humanities world and and the social science sciences to create, to make our data sets um, much more interoperable. Um, and so from you, Ottawa, I'm leading the work on um, TEI to RDF conversion. How do we take all of these like fantastic um, uh, TEI based projects and convert them to be more sort of interoperable with one another? Uh, certainly when I started this, I had been like, well, we took our hierarchical TEI and converted it into graph format. How hard could it be to move from that workflow to like linked data, also graph format, great, no problem. Uh, of course, it's much harder, but also a good deal of, um, of fun. So the, the work that we've sort of started um, in heading down this, this road has been to, um, to start by customizing um, a version of Torsten Schrader's uh, Xtriples um, tool from, uh, from Mainz. I was sorry to miss this conference when it was in mind. It's like, what fun that would have been to all be together. Do you remember when we all used to get together? <sighs> My heart, anyway. Um, but um, that, uh, that, that uh, we started some of that uh, customization work to not only help produ people produce their own linked data um, out of their TEI, but also to contribute to the links uh, triple store, which will be live uh, two years from now. Um, and will mean that, you know, for everyone who is, has in their own siloed project been keeping track of like Margaret Atwood's like awards and life that we can actually just have some central records for her, for example. And that the fact that like she shows up in our data set because she um, was an, an ally and an activist, uh, you know, speaking out about the bathhouse raids, um, the operation was called Operation Soap that was taking down these bathhouses. And as she sort of caustically said, I, I don't know what it is the police have against cleanliness, uh, you know, but uh, that people don't have to maintain records all about her. She's only a marginal character for us, or person for us, um, but for, for other people doing Canadian literary studies, she's a lot, um, a lot sort of heavier. So the work that we're doing now is in looking through the, you know, sort of current literature to, to see um, uh, what are some of the best sort of crosswalks, particularly to CDOC CRM, which will, um, uh, underpin much of the uh, the linked data in the links project, um, as well as the Quirk ontology, which is uh, uh, an ontology that's been designed um, at uh, Guelph and the University of Alberta uh, to cover literary events. And actually, uh, maybe Susan is here. Who's to say? <laughs> if she is, we should like we should make her uh, a panelist. That they've really done some very interesting work to both like avoid things like uh, reification, so that the the you know, triple set isn't sort of huge when people are using the quirk ontology, but that also lets us like record some of the ambiguity that we know are often in um, uh, these sources, like the, you know, shady, uh, it's not A, it's not B, it's not trash, it's just sort of insinuated lesbians, like how do we kind of get at those things and represent that as linked data without trying to like add some facticity that we don't really have evidence for, but things are just sort of you know, sort of suggested. Uh, they have a very interesting model um, in the uh, in the Quirk ontology, uh, in which um, uh, something like a cause of death is an entity rather than like a predicate, and so that you can then make statements about that cause of death, and it could have multiple multiple uh, like possible causes of death uh, to really actually like live up to that promise of linked data of anyone being able to say anything and having sort of conflicting facts. Anyway, so it's a, um, uh, a wonderful team um, to be working with. Uh, and, uh, and really is very much a collaboration between sort of computer science and the humanities and library and information um, science with my hat being off to um, uh, particularly our developer 
uh, Huma Zafar, who comes from two of those three worlds, um, uh, working on the X triples uh, customization. Um, and so one of the challenges here, and, and something that I would actually like love to discuss with folks if, if I mean, this conference is for people who come from all of these worlds, um, about the challenges of bringing together small researcher curated data sets like the kind we tend to see in, um, in TEI back projects and certainly that the LGLC represents in that you know, we're very sort of small in scope and we try to be very detailed, but that, that we're also trying to bring together data um, and this is Susan Brown, you know, sort of genius of, of also bringing in like large library data sets uh, and, and that those, all those sets are created with different goals in mind. Um, as Susan points out, there's, you know, sort of breadth versus specificity uh, and that, that the, you know, broad, you know, collections that are coming from library catalogs, for example, uh, reflect one set of needs. The specificity of TI encoded historical projects um, uh, is, a, is a different set of needs. How can we get these things to talk well with each other? Um, I see that brings me um, up to the, the 40 minutes, so perhaps I will stop gushing um, there, but I just want to say thank you very much, and I really am uh, looking forward uh, to the conversation. Great, thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Connie. Um, I believe um, what what we would normally have at this point is a, is a, a very long round of applause, which, um, which is slightly <laughs> missing from, a, um, from, from the virtual conference, but um, but uh, but yes, please please do um, imagine um, imagine that, and you know, use that as the the, the two minutes to have a breather. Um, I, I think maybe before we go to the um, the Q and A, which um, which Valeria is is monitoring um, for us, we might um, have some some brief discussion in the in the panel. We have um, as well as as well as Constance, we have um, Valeria and Jonathan and Federico from the um, Link Pass Program Committee are are here. Um, so, um, so if anyone has any any questions they want to, I have a couple of questions, but I don't want to jump um, jump in first necessarily. So, does anyone else want to? Uh... Can I ask about? So go ahead, Tom. Sorry, Freddie. Um, we've all got questions, obviously. Um, I was really interested in what you said about ambiguity and how you handle that in triples. Could you just say a bit more about that? Indeed, indeed. I think um, uh, that originally the thought, especially on links, was that like reification was going to be the way and that like every triple would have to also act as an entity in and of itself so that we could say, well, says who? I mean, so much of, particularly for our project, the, the says who really matters. Is this the Toronto Star saying this? Is this some queer periodical saying this? You know, and that we might want to filter and, and, and treat those differently as sources. Um, but that looked like it would be an enormous sort of burden um, to the project. Um, and so I mean, maybe I can just sort of put it in the chat. Um, hopefully not telling tales out of school by doing this, but um, that the, um, the quirk ontology does a very good job of trying to, uh, trying to get around reification by having uh, sort of cultural formation entities about which uh, we can then make assertions um, so that, that we can have that sort of says who quality without um, exploding um, everything out. I will if I yeah, do this here because you know uh, I don't know that like can I really say Emily Dickinson was a lesbian but is it is it ignoring like too much of her life to say that she like that these like deep affective relationships she had with women were mm, somehow sort of hideable and, and I think one of the challenges too as we work through um, digital scholarship is to like not flatten all the things that we have uncovered in history, right? There is this actually this tendency to, you know, to make things comprehensible, to want to flatten this, this ambiguity out, but are we risking like returning to like the dark ages of the 1940s, you know, by, by doing that? Great, thanks. That's really interesting. I'll look at the link as well. Um, I have a question. Uh, I, I really liked the talk. It was like a really fantastic overview. Um, and I have to say to, to the other panelists, uh, I was actually planning to be here as an attendee, and I just realized later that as I'm part of the program committee, I will jump into the panelists. So, but yeah, well, it's fantastic to be here. Uh, I was wondering when you mentioned the uh, 3,000 events, the, 
encoded with information regarding people and places and organization. I was wondering, when you try to connect this type of information, highly curated, to the larger semantic web or to linked open that, what is the, how many of them are represented or are already there? And so what's the coverage and in which way they are already present in the semantic web and what is the thing that you can add using your information? Do, do you know, we did some like just like preliminary kind of studies here and we found that for our people, about 30% of them show up in VIAF, the Virtual International Authority file. Um, that is par partially a, a legacy of um, uh, the sort of the Canadian literary scene producing so much work that then is easily archivable. So, you know, there's like histories as to why that is. Um, and, uh, and just a little bit over that, like a little bit under 40% um, of the people are in um, in end events and, and that sort of thing. In, um, wiki data okay um, not that like i don't know i'm I mean, like always at like sixes and sevens about wiki data it was like a great idea and the entities are very solid i have reservations about their ontology and like those things eventually merge together right you can't just sort of have one without the other um but one of the things we've actually sort of been toying with is like should we be you know sort of reaching out to wiki data and like trying to flood them with lglc people you know I mean, we also have lots of people that are the um one guy who wrote in an angry letter to the newspaper, you know, who is almost a blank note for us, uh, you know, that we wouldn't, wouldn't want to do that with. But so we've had some, some good, some good success there. I think it will be hard for, um, you know, projects that are doing more of the like, in, in 1530, we know there was a blacksmith named John Smith who lived on this street, you know, that like that, yeah, it becomes much, much harder, but because we're working with 20th century sources, it's easier for us. Yeah, no, no, exactly. Uh, I'm working as part of Living with Machines at the Alan Turing Institute. And yeah, we are seeing these <laughs> challenges every time. So, so that's why I was asking. Yeah, thanks so much. Okay. Yeah, so a quick reminder to, to everyone who's watching um, in the audience that there is a Q&A function. Um, so if you, you can't ask your questions out loud, please do put them in the Q&A function and we'll, um, we'll keep an eye out for those and, um, and we'll, we'll ask, uh, we'll, we'll try to have, try to have uh, uh, Constance addressed them here. Um, I was particularly um, impressed by the way this project, or it's, it's part of a family of projects, right, that that has been um, changing methodologies as new technologies have come about and as new um, social possibilities have come about for, you know, nearly 100 years. I mean, it's not, it's not, um, it's not just um, you know, someone had the idea of how to build it and it was perfect from day one. Um, but, you know, it, it's, um, it's it's developed not not necessarily improved but 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 you know new technologies have have been adopted and have changed the way they've um, worked which I think is 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 the ideal way to run a project and it's it's also ideal not to move too quickly with those technologies to, to you know to to follow them rather than um than than trying to be cutting edge all the time but um I, so I was wondering um to what degree we could go back or have have you or anyone else ever thought about going back and using um some uh, cutting edge technologies like um, machine learning and um, natural language processing to try and redo some of uh, Jeanette Howard Foster's work of finding references to lesbianism in historical texts, um, you know, statistically, as it were, um, programmatically. Oh, I haven't, but I would love to. And that, like, certainly, her, like, her bibliography would be an amazing sort of training set for like, here are all these books, there are lesbians in here, uh, you know, and then, you know, where else are there lesbians in, in the happy trust, you know, or something like that, that like might uncover the thing, or to, you know, to, to find out, you know, how many lesbians are there, but also probably, but also uh, how much of this is trashy, you know, <laughs> considering what like Zimmer, um, Zimmerman and Bradley sort of thought was uh, not good literature, but, but certainly, you know, um, uh, good gay content. Yeah. Oh, I haven't but I would want to. Yeah. I mean, we'd, I suppose there'd be the, um, the sort of issue of uh, wanting to be careful how you designed that because we don't want to design a tool that will go out and automatically out people, right? I mean, that's, that's not, no. so it's, it's, but I guess. No. Yes, I would say um, with literature, yes. With yeah. people's private letters, no. Yeah. <laughs> that, that actually, that too, even just in, I mean, you know, we're, we're looking at um, 
archival sources in a manual way and things that haven't been digitized and that kind of thing. But even there too, you know, we're working with public sources, things that were, you know, people who were activists, people, the content that was in, you know, newspapers and magazines, sort of not um, so many of those sort of private collections. I mean, actually too, for the, the Lesbian Gay Liberation in Canada project, we haven't um, integrated our material with other collections yet. And we have a takedown policy to, you know, make it clear to people how they can contact us and, uh, you know, a sort of a method for making like, you know, blank notes and blank notes around those blank notes to, to, um, to try to hide things if anyone uh, reaches out to us. We've actually so far only had one person though, uh, reach out to somebody who uh, shared the same name with his grandfather, who was uh, an MP in, or an MPP in uh, Ontario, um, but he was born in 1916. And, you know, this felt was born a lot later. And so we actually decided not to take him out and that no one will, we don't think we'll confuse the two, but. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Um, Valeria, do you want to take over? Um, yes, I I will. You know, speak one quick question if I can, and then I will read uh, the request from the from our audience. Um, thank you very much. It was a very very engaging and interesting and informative talk. Um, one of the things that really uh, struck me was your reference to the ability of um, establishing connection between the roles of, you know, the people mentioned in the events. So those that were both part of the events and um, uh, witnesses then relating the event. And that really made me think that, you know, linked open data, text encoding, I mean, structured data, they're not, you know, clearly not just for archiving, they're just, they are for investigating, they are analytical tools that, you know, really help us discovering new things. And this is a bit of a cheeky question, but if you can, you know, think of, you know, one thing that was not obvious reading the documents and that really, you know, was highlighted by these, you know, new ways of um, establishing connections. I know it's hard to, you know, on top yeah, of yeah, that, so, if you could. No, I think uh, one of the things that was like a surprise to us was, you know, that, that, um, gay liberation ideas, you know, it's like not sort of like uniform across the country in Canada, like even after the 1990s and rights are not the same and, you know, this sort of thing. And then we, um, well, we just like, I don't know, created like an animated like uh, network graph of, of um, different like groups, I guess maybe I have two answers here, like different groups over the years. And we could see where members of groups start coming together. And there's like all these like peripheral groups that are like not at the like beating sort of hearts of the center of gay liberation in Canada that are like, oh, like a fine arts group that like joins or like the Francophone groups and the Anglophone groups like aren't speaking to each other and they, we start to see them, you know, join each other over time. Uh, but one of the things that we didn't expect to find but did, did find was that um, in terms of the concepts of gay liberation, there's uh, like one man who worked in um, Ontario, Doug Wilson, for years and uh, and then moved to Saskatchewan, sort of smaller province, and then like Saskatchewan becomes this like hotbed of gay liberation activity. And it turns out like it has a lot to do with Doug Wilson, but it's not just that like he was the head of every group. But we can now see which periodicals he was contributing to, and then who joined those periodicals, and went off and formed this like splinter group, and that became the Youth Council that informed the United United Churches, like you know, and sort of being able to see that, which we couldn't just see from the text, was really um, was really exciting. Thank you. And if if that's okay with you, we have a couple of questions from the people attending, and one is from Joachim Rahet, and apologies in advance for all the mispronunciation of names. Um, which is asking uh, if you mentioned the name of the WordPress plugins for linked data conversion. Oh, certainly. I'll pop it in here. Um, uh, the, the plugin that, um, that James Mohannes is customizing is called Pods, uh, and it, uh, it takes in tabular data uh, and... Uh, and then creates it, it converts it to JSON LD. And what he's working on is like little crosswalks built in there that sort of says, uh, you know, um, if you say you have a person and you mean a person in the schema.org kind of way, then, you know, we can make sure that your JSON LD is schema.org um, compliant and that kind of thing. So he's done that. He's working on that with our project and he's done it for um, uh, a um, 
Victorian periodicals project, uh, the yellow 90s online um, as well. And, and as part of links, there will be a move to, to create more of these sort of easy to use tools for folks who aren't going to necessarily learn a lot about linked data from under the hood, but might trust us well enough <laughs> to, um, uh, to be being responsible with the uh, ontologies and that kind of thing. Okay, thank you. And we have uh, another question, but um, it's up to you if you maybe want to leave this as the very last one. And it's Jen Williams that is asking if it would be possible to have a very quick walkthrough of the LGLC web app. Oh, certainly, I would be delighted. Um, it's, they always say like, oh, never do live apps. Never do live apps, never do... Um, uh, um, uh, never do live demos because it's just asking for trouble, but um, I'm, I'm happy to do it. You know, a little bit like, you know, like everyone knows someone who has like one of those small dogs who like always loves to do these great tricks until someone is watching, like, you know, oh no, he always rolls over. He's doing it all the time, but not when someone's watching. Anyway, um, <coughs> I will hope for great things here. Um, so this is the web app that's sitting on top of the, um, <coughs> on top of the database. Um, and we have sort of some of the you know, editorial principles and about and how to contact us. Um, the real money is in being able to um, to search the database. So uh, this is where the 34,000 entities live. Um, let me say, I'll look, I'm, I'm in Ottawa right now, so I will say Ottawa. Um, and the original version of this um, we built on uh, like two virtual machines that I spun up myself on like some national computing infrastructure and for a while and then with students, you know, <coughs> built um, a Node.js front end uh, and uh, that was like a delight but also like a bit leaky in that like uh, I don't have the security, you know, sort of cred in the systems administration cred to really be sort of doing that and like um, serving out something that's sort of professional um, and so the this version of the front end was uh, redesigned by a commercial company, and the project is now um, housed at the Ryerson University um, Library uh, and Archives. It is much more secure here than when I was doing systems administration, as there's a reason people go to school for 10 years to have that kind of role, and um, that sort of wasn't my background. Anyway, so you can search on people, places, and things. Our, our actual goal is like not have people just use the search the database function, but instead to to look for something, but then to browse sort of from there, to be able to read the text description of an event that happened, and then to look at related events, to maybe say, oh, let's look at um, you know, some more of the citations, who else is, is citing these things, who else, what other events you know, are being sort of witnessed to in these sources, uh, or let's find out you know, sort of more of the things that happened in, um, in Ottawa, or to click through to um, uh, read more about the uh, the organizations like the New Democratic Party of Ontario and, and sort of what they were involved in as they went along. So it's really taking the entities in Don's text um, and connecting them to uh, to one another to to be able to navigate the text um, in in a new way. So no, that's, I guess that's the, that's the quick tour. Thank you. That was, that was lovely. Um, we have one more question uh, from Nicolas Guterle. I hope. Um, if you could give again the name of the literature ontology developed at the University of Alberta. Oh, certainly, certainly. It's the, the, the acronym is uh, is Quirk, and I should have, I should have said what the acronym stands for. Um, it's the uh, Canadian uh, Writing and Research, re sorry, the Canadian Writing Research Collaboratory um, is the name of the, the group that has created it. So that's what the Quirk you know, sort of stands for. Um, and that work is there. They also have a, an endpoint, you know, so it's possible to kind of look at some of their stuff there. And it grows out of the um, Orlando project, uh, which too, I mean, in Canada is one of these, as you say, Gabriel, like these, you know, projects that has evolved with time. It's, I think, 29 years old. So like, you know, predates the commercial web and was an SGML project 
look at looking at recovering uh, women's literary uh, contributions, and that that Quirk kind of grows out of that. And a lot of the the, um, the Orlando data is now in um, in in Quirk ontology form, and, and that's what you're searching on if you use their sparkling point. Great, thank you. Um, I think this is probably the point at which we would have the second round of applause. Um, and um, thank you very much again for this um, this keynote. It's been great to see, um, you know, practical application um, along with you know the historical contextualizing of the project, not only in its earlier phases, pre-linked data, but um, but but the importance of the project and the some of the sensitivities of of the data and and all you know the complexity and you know shortcomings of linked data um, and and semantic web technologies as well um, uh, around that. Um, so I think it's been it's been a really useful case study um, uh, of all that uh, that that kind of um, content. So so thank you very much for that.